What's up everyone, Matt here from Native Instruments and today we are talking about how to use everything in Massive X. Now when you first open this plugin, it can absolutely seem extremely confusing. It's so complex, there's so many different parameters and modulation happening all over the place. But the goal of this video is to get you familiar with the plugin. Now we've all had those times where we got a dope track rocking, we load up a preset, it sounds awesome, but we don't know where the extra noise is coming from or why our filter is being modulated by an LFO at some weird sync rate. By the end of this video, we should be able to look at Massive X, understand what's being mapped where and know how to adjust it. I'm gonna break down this plugin section by section. After, we'll throw a few instances on a track I already have made and adjust it to fit our song. But first, let's check out what this thing's capable of. So here we are inside Massive X. I currently have it loaded in Complete Control Standalone, and you can load this in any DAW as a VST. Let's first talk about our global commands in the header here. Right here, you have a drop-down menu where you can control different things like the visual size, sensitivity of the controls, and different themes. So you have like dark mode, which is cool. You have this flat design, which is a very minimal look. And some of these actually change depending on which preset you have selected. These are all of our macro knobs, which we're gonna cover in a separate section, but this is easy access for macros. Over here, you have pitch bend, modulation, and aftertouch. Again, we're gonna cover this in a different section. Up here, this is your volume meter. You can easily adjust the master output volume just by changing this. And the most important part is our browser. If you click here, you can open the browser. You can separate by different attributes. You have sound types and different characters, such as dark, melodic, things like that. You just click them again to deselect them. Down at the bottom, if you have any Massive X expansions, these are where all your expansions are going to be. So you can actually select an expansion and then search within that expansion by selecting an attribute. And if there is a sound type within the expansion, it will show up with the expansion selected. Again, you just click to deselect them. You can also search for different things. So if you just want to search for bass, it's not just gonna search for presets with the word bass in the name, it's actually going to search with what type of preset it is. So you'll get a large list of different presets just by using the search menu. This little button here is your user presets. So if you have any saved user presets, they'll show up here. And this star is for your favorites. One of the features I like to use the most, cause you can actually go and say, I love this preset, this one's awesome. This one's great. And then when you click on your favorites, they're all gonna show up right there. So really great feature. I love the favorites. And that is the global headers. Let's talk about this top section of Massive X here. This is what I like to call the audio module section or your sound generators. But this is where all of your sound is generated and where it comes from. So before we touch on pitch and glide, let's first talk about our wavetable oscillators. And let's start by breaking down what an oscillator is. An oscillator is a device or an electronic device that produces a signal or frequency. Now within an oscillator, there's different types of waves. And let's start with the sine wave, which is the most basic. It produces one frequency with no harmonics. And this is how that sounds.
you see it's very smooth and round. It doesn't have any additional frequencies. It's just one based off what note you're playing. Now let's play a square wave and you're gonna hear it's a lot brighter, it's a lot more exciting, it's kind of edgier because it has additional harmonics from the root frequency. In Massive X, you have wavetable oscillation. And what that means is instead of just having one oscillator that only has one type of wave, you can actually switch between different waves within the oscillator. Anything that has a line under it is actually a menu, and you can click on this and select different types of waves. This one is a sine, triangle, sol, and square wave. And what that means is, you can see the animation here. Let's go back to a sine wave. See how it's round and smooth? The next one is the triangle. See the triangle shape there? Then we get to a saw wave. It looks like a little sawtooth. Then if we keep going, we migrate to a square wave. So you get multiple different types of waves within the oscillator. And this is just one wavetable. Let's see what happens when we move the knob and switch between the different waves. So we'll start on a sine wave and then I'll modulate it up. Hear those harmonics? And what this is doing is it's making this type of wave very fast, constantly giving you that sound. And based on what frequency, you play off of which note changes the rate at which that wave is moving. So we can go in here and select a crazy wavetable. Look at this one here. You can see how it changes. And this is just another example of a wavetable within the oscillator. And you have all these different wavetables to choose from. Some are from Throwback Massive, and then other ones are new and were just created for Massive X. Let's try this one. So that is oscillator one. Let's just change this back to a basic sine triangle saw square wave. Now here you actually have two oscillators and this is the main sound source within Massive. This is how you create your sound with these two oscillators. So if we turn this one on, let's just play a note here. And we'll turn this one up. Let's change the waveform. So now you're hearing a blend of two oscillators. These faders right here are your volume for each oscillator, so you can blend them together. So now we have two oscillators playing, two different sounds. What's really cool about these oscillators is you have different oscillator modes. Now, modes can get pretty confusing because there's so many of them and there's so many things you can do. But for instance, right now on oscillator one, we have a standard mode and a sine wave, which means this wave is just starting in the middle point, going up, coming back down, and then going back to the middle point. And that's one cycle. Now you can change the direction. So maybe instead of going up, it actually goes down and then up. You can change the polarity. You have all these different modes to change your oscillation. And each mode gives you different parameters within it. So for instance, here's bend. So what that does is instead of it being a smooth sine wave like this, it's gonna bend that first part of the wave and then come back down. You can hear how it affects it. So you have so much control over each oscillator with different modes within each one. So for instance, here is Gorilla. And 
and you can multiply that and get more harmonics out of it. We can change it to different ones. So you can hear by simply changing the mode, you can really change the signal of your oscillator. And when you combine different modes and different oscillators, You can really see how you can manipulate a sound and make it your own. And those are the wavetable modes within each oscillator. Moving on here, let's talk about phase modulation. And that's this entire section down here. You have two different phase modulators, PM1, phase modulator one, and PM2. Now, what is phase modulation? Basically what it is, is you have one oscillator that's a carrier, and then you have a second oscillator that modulates this oscillator's phase or waveform based off of this oscillator's waveform. So for instance, if oscillator, we'll call this oscillator one, is a square wave, we can modulate the sound of this oscillator with a sine wave or a different wave. What does that mean exactly? Basically what it does is it creates rich harmonic overtones or undertones from one oscillator's frequency. Now, it's a good way to get very unique sounds with one oscillator. It's typically used in FM synthesizers. So let's just flip through a few different ones and see how it sounds and how it reacts. So I'm going to set this back to a sine wave. We're using oscillator one only and we have it set to a square. That's what it sounds like. Now let's turn on phase modulator one and turn up the modulation as we hold the note and you'll hear how it changes the sound. See how it makes it brighter and thicker? And let's do it to a sine wave so you can really hear how it changes it. Let's change this to a triangle. So what it's doing is it's modulating the oscillator one sine wave with a triangle wave. Within phase modulation, there are different pitch modes that you can actually adjust. So the most common is gonna be ratio. This is probably what you'll use most of the time because it actually sounds great. It pretty much eliminates all the bad harmonics. But what it does is it multiplies or divides the oscillator's harmonics based off of this ratio number. So if I set this to three, it's now going to multiply or divide by three, giving you a third harmonic of the frequency that you're playing based off the note. If I put it back to one, just so you can hear, that's the difference. The next mode is key track. What this does is it locks the pitch based off of the MIDI note that you're playing. So you can actually go and if you wanna maybe set this to an octave higher, or if you're doing something with low end, you could go down an octave. Great for creating bass or bass plucks. And then beyond that, we get to fixed mode. Now fixed mode works off of a number. 60 is related to middle C, that's the MIDI note. So if I play C, it's going to sound good. Now if I change this to 61, now the pitch is actually C sharp. So if I play C, it's not gonna sound that great, but if I play C sharp, it's smooth because the phase is modulating with the correct pitch of the note. Again, you're probably just gonna wanna keep this on ratio, but you can get weird and do all sorts of things with that. Now, moving on from this, because you only have two phase modulators and you have a few different waves. Let's just go through a couple and see what they sound like. Here's a triangle wave. Oh, 
But what's cool is you're not limited to only these waves because what you can actually do is route oscillator two in a way to where it phase modulates oscillator one or vice versa. So I'm just gonna do that quickly. And we're gonna get into routing in a little bit. So I'm gonna take oscillator two and send it to phase modulator. Then I'm gonna turn PM1 off. We'll turn on auxiliary. And you'll notice if I turn on oscillator two, we'll turn this all the way up, you're not gonna hear anything. And that's because it's not sending to the output. It's only sending the wave to modulate oscillator one. So now that that's turned up, let's turn oscillator one back on. And I'm gonna turn up the auxiliary as I hold the note. So now we're using oscillator two to phase modulate oscillator one, which gives you so many possibilities. So we can change this. And that's just one additional way of phase modulating with oscillator two. So the only other thing that's worth mentioning here is your pitch. You do have a pitch option and you can click and drag up and down. and they are separate by oscillator, one on each side. These below it are used for modulation, and we will touch on that when we get into that tab. You can also do the same settings, fixed, ratio, and key track. So now let's move over to the noise generator. And to do this, I'm gonna turn off oscillators one and two, and let's just hear noise one. So I'm gonna turn this up by using the fader here. We have two separate noise generators. If you click on this menu dropdown, these are all the different noise options you have. Static, friction, environment, machines, there's, there's so many. Let's flip through a few. Let's go to something crazy like machines. So lots of cool noise that you can add to your sound. And same thing here, you can individually change the pitch. Double click sets it back to zero, or you can key track. Let's go to something that has a little bit more tone so you can really hear it. You have two noise generators, one and two, both with individual control. You can turn them on and off by just clicking here. And this is the fader for noise two. And you can blend them together. You can have one pitched, one key track. Again, the options are kind of endless here. Let's hear what that sounds like with the oscillators. So just another way you can really add some fuzz to your sound, or if you're making a synth pad, that would be a great way to use some noise in the background to create some ambiance. Now let's move on to the next module here, which is the filter. Within our filter here, you have nine different filter options. And these are many different types of filters. They each have their own character, their own sound, and you can flip between different ones, and each one will also give you different control parameters. So let's just see what this sounds like. You can change the type of filter here. These are different low pass with this one. You can see the curve is a little bit different. You have resonance. And again, each filter is, is kind of different and unique. Now the filters are really a key element within Massive X because it gives you the option to shape and sculpt your sound 
or it gives you the option to add LFOs to it and modulate it. There's so many different things you can do with the filter that it's definitely something I pretty much use on every single preset or patch. There is only one main dedicated filter, but if we move to the next module, which is our insert effect modules, you can actually add additional filters by using the utility. This is something that's not really known, but if you click on utility, you have different high pass and low pass options for filters. So you can actually do multiple filters within Massive X. Now, insert effects are different types of effects, bit crushers, bass enhancers. You get three different slots for them and you can route them in multiple different ways. You see how this corresponds here? A, B, C, here is A, B, C. These are our three different insert effects. And we're gonna touch on this when we really get into the routing, but for now, I'm just gonna route them to each other. Now let's set, uh, let's do a bit crusher. You can see how that manipulates the sound, distortion. Let's maybe uh, lower the pitch on this oscillator. You have different options within each insert effect as well. Frequency shifters. And to turn them off, you simply click right here. The menu is the underline, and that gives you options for different insert effects. You can also insert oscillators. Now we're sending oscillator one and two into another oscillator. So many different options for insert effects. The next step in the chain here is our amp level. This is actually the end of the chain. This is just your, your amp. So let's just turn this back on for now. This is master volume. You have pan. Double click to reset. And then a feedback loop which allows you to route the sound back into itself, giving you really cool harmonics and deep tones. Now this does have to be routed. And let's turn that up. So you can hear how it's kind of feeding back into itself, multiplying in a way. Just a cool way to create some more harmonics. Our last audio module here is our stereo effects. Now these are the last thing it's going to hit before it gets to the amplifier output. Lots of cool stereo effects. They're labeled here as X, Y, and Z. You can route these in multiple different ways. They can be parallel with each other. They can go through each other. They can all be added and then go to the output. But these are just simply stereo effects. Dimension expander, really cool for making your sound super wide. You have equalizers, flangers, reverbs, delays. Turn this size up. Can add uh, maybe a delay. So this is really a way to polish your sound at the end once you've really dialed in tonally what your sound should sound like. Now you can add verbs, delays, flangers, phasers, things like that to really give it the final touch to be ready for production. So those are your stereo effects. And again, it's the last step in the chain before the amplifier. So now we're moving on to our modulation modules. These are the lower section down here, which is all made for modulation. What's cool is these are color coded. So you'll notice P, which is orange. These are your performers. 
These are your envelopes, they're blue. Your LFOs are green. Here are your key trackers, they're purple. And then your voice randomization is pink. Let's start by talking about the amp envelope. This is the main way to control and shape your sound, which is using an envelope on the overall amplifier. Now within an envelope, you have different parameters, attack, decay, sustain, release. Those are the most common, ADSR, and I like to think of it in different stages. So attack, that would be our first stage. This is what happens from when you touch the key to how fast the sound is going to come in from its lowest level to its highest level. Right now, you'll notice the attack is set to 0.5 milliseconds. So when I hit the key, it's instantly loud. Now, if we make this longer and you'll see the animation it does, now I hit the key, you'll hear it fade in slowly. The next stage is our decay. And to really understand decay, I think it's also good to understand sustain at the same time. Now, here you can see when I turn sustain down, decay moves the overall envelope. But when we turn sustain up, now you can see how it's acting. It's basically stage two, how long it takes to go from attack to the sustain stage. Here you'll hear the dip as it dips down to holding the note at the sustain level. You hear the huh. And if we turn this longer or shorter, it's really fast to get to that middle level. Now if we turn sustain all the way up, you're not really gonna notice the decay because it's going straight from attack to sustain. The next stage in the envelope is our release. And with release, this is how long it takes from when you let go of the key to the sound to go to its lowest amplitude. We turn it up. Hear how it slowly rings out. Turn it up longer. So this is really useful if you were using a, a cool atmospheric pad, for instance, and you want your attack to be long and your release to be long. You can hear how just by changing the envelope, you can really shape your sound. A few other options that we have within the amp envelope are shape. You can actually adjust the shape of the attack. So for instance, if I turn this down, you'll notice it's less linear and more parabolic here. So it kind of eases in and then comes up. You can also do it the other way. You can change the peak, how high it actually goes. And you can do the same thing with sustain. You also have these two other options called hold, and this is a in-between option. So it's in between the stage of attack and decay. It'll hold, you can see it draw in the animation, that level before it gets to the next stage. And this is in milliseconds here. So you have holds it and then drops to decay. Same thing on release, you have a hold option. The other thing you have is velocity settings. So you can actually determine how this envelope reacts based on velocity of the key. The next thing with our envelopes are modulation envelopes. And these are identical to the amp envelope, but allow you to put them on different parameters within Massive X. If we click this little crosshair right here, you can drag different modulators to different parameters. And you see all these little boxes appear. And this means we can make this parameter change based off of this envelope. So I'm gonna drag this right here to the filter. You notice it's not doing anything. If you click on the name E2, envelope two, which is this one right here, modulator two, and pull down, or if you're 
knob is over here, you can pull up and now you're going to see it's modulating the other way. So you can go either direction. So let's let's start high like this. And you see already I'm getting a different sound based off of this wave. So let's slow down the attack. And now it's taking that knob and it's like me. Let's bypass this. I'm going to right click or hold control and delete. It's basically like me doing this. Right? Same exact thing that's happening with the modulation. Now what's cool, if you delete a parameter and you drag it back to it, it's going to remember the setting that you had. So we can manipulate this. And you can do some really cool stuff here. You can also drag this modulator to multiple parameters. So if we want this to change the pitch, we can drag it to the master pitch over here. And let's turn this up 12 semitones, so one octave, and listen to how it changes the pitch and the filter at the same time. And the speed of that is based off of the attack of this envelope. So if I speed up the attack, hear how it changes and it makes it faster. So that's a modulation envelope. There is another type of envelope called the exciter envelope. But before we talk about that, I think it's important to understand LFOs because they kind of go hand in hand. So let's go to the next tab here, which are all LFOs. One thing to also note is you can change these modulators by simply clicking the underlying name and you can switch these to LFOs or different envelopes simply like that. And it also changes the color and the name here. So under the LFO tab, L4, we have a switcher LFO. An LFO is a low frequency oscillator. What that is, is it basically gives you the ability to modulate things off of a waveform. So if you were to use an LFO with a sine wave, it would make it go like this, the entire sound or however much you want. Now with switcher LFO, you can change between all these different waves and you can also make this knob change as well. But for an example here, let's drag L4 to our filter. I'm going to turn the filter down halfway and then let's turn the modulation up. Now you'll notice when I hit a key, it is oscillating with the low frequency oscillator. Now right now, it's set to bipolar. Let's switch through a couple waves and then I'll break these down. More of a saw wave. Kind of a sine wave. Here's a square wave. Here I was just on and off, on and off. But for right now, let's keep it right here. Now, you can change the speed of this with the rate knob. And this is in Hertz, so this is just free play. You can set it to whatever you want. If we turn this button on here, it'll restart the rate, the cycle of the wave every time we hit a note. The next setting is sync which is probably the most common used. This syncs it to your project's BPM or tempo. You have different options for syncing. And to change these, you simply click on the number and drag up or down. So this would be eighth note sync. We can change this to 16th notes. And you can switch between these. Now you also have OSC, 
And what this does is it changes the rate based off of higher or lower notes on the key bed. So you'll hear if I play higher notes, it's going to be really fast. And if I play lower notes, it's going to be slow. So kind of cool for doing some unique sound design stuff there. For now, let's set this to sync and 16th notes will work. Down here, we have a few different options. We have loop. What loop is, is it's an infinite loop of oscillation. So even while you're not touching anything, it's doing this at its own rate constantly, even when you're not playing. If you want consistency, loop restart is probably the best way to go because what it does is every time you hit a note, it restarts the cycle of the LFO. Hear how it's the same every single time, whereas if it's on loop, the starting point of the LFO is different every time. So loop restart is probably the most common used. You also have loop gate. And what loop gate does is it actually releases the LFO as soon as you let go of the note. So to give you an example, I'm gonna turn the release up. And now you hear when I let go of the note, the LFO stops as well. Let's turn the release up a little bit more to really hear it. So you hear how it stops modulating when I let go of the note. Here we have loop release, and this is actually the opposite. The LFO will start when you let go of the note, so it deactivates when you push the note. Here how it starts after the note is, is released. We have one shot. And this will do one cycle of an LFO and then stop. And you have one shot release, which is similar to loop release. It will do one cycle of the LFO after the note is released. And that's it. Again, most of the time you're gonna wanna keep this on loop restart for consistency. Below that we have MIDI and remote. This is just how it's triggered. Probably keep it on MIDI. Remote is if you're using an external remote to trigger your LFO. Now we have mono. Let me explain what mono does because this is actually really cool. So if I hold one note and then begin to play another one, it will actually oscillate the second note at a new rate. Hear how they're not in sync together. Now if I turn mono on, it will start oscillating at the exact same rate with that new note. No matter when I push it, it's always gonna be synced. So that's a really good feature, is to keep mono on if you want both oscillators or all of your voices to use the same cycle of the LFO. Let's talk about bipolar and unipolar and uni-Z. Now bipolar, you can see here how it splits gray over here and then does green on this side for the modulation. And what that's doing is it's actually, the LFO is starting at the lower point and it's going negative 100 to positive 100. So it's giving you a much wider sweep. Now if we switch it to uni, now the start point is here and then it goes to the high point and back as opposed to bipolar you're getting this full range. So I'll let you hear the difference. Here how it doesn't go as full of the range as bipolar. Now uni Z is very similar to uni. The only difference is it's going to restart when a new note is triggered. Below that we have delay and you can actually see what's happening with the little waveform animation here. This just delays when the low frequency oscillator will start. Right now it's on right away. You see how it's pushing that wave back. Here's 150 milliseconds. It starts a little bit after. Double click to reset it. We have fall rise. This just gives you a little bit more control over how the wave of the LFO is affecting the modulation. So if I turn this up, or if I turn it down, see 
how it stops. It's very cool. So this affects how it starts to modulate. Double click to reset. Other than that, we have our LFO volume, which is useful if you only want to hear a little bit of the modulation. And that is a low frequency oscillator on switcher. Within LFOs, there's also a random LFO option. This is really cool for getting crazy modular style synth sounds in my opinion. So you have this random LFO, same controls over here with your loop, loop restart, things like that, mono, rate. You can change this between free and sync. Same options here, uni, bipolar, fall, rise. So let's just drag this to the filter and see what this sounds like. So you notice amp jitter is all the way down. When this is all the way down, all it does is give you a basic LFO, depending on which shape you have set here. Now it's a square wave. Now the seed gives you an option to kind of repeat random events in a way. So if we turn the amp jitter up, this is going to give us those random LFOs. And now you can kind of use seed to select different parts and it's going to repeat them every time you trigger a note. Let's go to a different part of the sequence. So you can hear how it restarts it every time I trigger the note, you get that same amount of randomness repeated, which is pretty cool if you find something you really like. Let's set that to zero. You're only going to get this seed option in loop restart, loop gate, a couple modes like that. In regular loop mode, you won't see that because it's truly random. Now we also have frequency jitter, which is going to adjust the frequency based off the LFO. <laughs> Kind of hearing some of that wow and things like that by turning that up. And then we have threshold, and your threshold basically sets the limit at which the randomness is going to start. So if I turn this up, it's it's not gonna really do too much oscillating. And then when it hits a certain threshold, it will then start to oscillate. <laughs> It's not really doing anything until it hurts a certain cycle of the threshold. We turn it down. It's all over the place. So these settings over here are also the same, uni and buy. And you can also adjust your delay, fall. And that is the random LFO. One other feature to talk about quickly is the audio noise. This basically turns this random LFO into a noise generator. And you can go into the routing tab and actually route it as a noise generator. Now that we've talked about LFOs, I think it's a good point to go back and talk about the exciter envelope. Because in my opinion, it is very similar to an LFO, but with its own characteristics. So this is the exciter envelope here. You see it has very few controls. Let's go ahead and drag this to our filter as we've been doing. I'm going to shift down a couple octaves. And let's see what it sounds like without anything. I've also shortened up the release a little bit. Let's make it even shorter. So that's our sound right now. Let's turn up the modulation from the exciter envelope. Right now it's set to bi-directional. And you can hear how it's affecting the filter based off of this shape right here. So in our settings, we have shape, attack. See how you can change it from linear, parabolic. And you can do the same with the release. Here you have ratio. This determines the length of the cycle. You have center, which changes the tilt of the attack and the release. 
Then you have hold, which changes how long until it reaches the next point. Now you can also change this to uni. And window. You see window actually is almost identical to uni, but eliminates the shape and mirrors the attack and the release. So now it's just going up, down. Here you're getting both up and down of the cycles. So just another really cool modulator envelope. I think it's really good for doing fast things, especially with percussion. You can also drag this over to, let's drag it to the waveform. Pull this down. You can really get some cool things with the exciter envelope there. I think one other thing to touch on is the velocity settings. When this is set to zero, regardless of what your velocity is, it's going to do the same exact modulation. And if I turn this up, this modulator is going to be dependent on the velocity. So if I hit a note lightly, it's not going to apply as much modulation compared to if I hit the note hard. So this would be a light touch with a note. And this is a heavy touch. You hear the difference of how it's actually modulating based off velocity. So that is a nice, cool feature. Now that you know what an exciter envelope is, let's move on to key trackers. Key trackers are really cool for modulation, and I think it's one of those things that's slightly underused. Now, what you can do with this, let's start by dragging the key tracker to our filter as we've been doing, and I'm gonna pull the modulation down. I'm also gonna drag it to the noise so you can really hear what's going on. We'll turn that up. Now you'll notice here is C negative one all the way up to C eight, and here's our key bed. So what's happening is based off of which key you're pushing and which octave, it's gonna control the amount of modulation being applied. So if I play, C2, you'll see the filter's not really on and there's not really any noise. But if we go up a couple octaves, even more. Now that filter is being pushed all the way down almost and our noise is getting turned up. You can hear it. Let's go down to a low octave again. Almost no noise. Go up. And now you're hearing all the noise. So this is just one of the ways to use a key tracker. You also have a few other options. You have velocity on. So this is based off velocity. So if I push it hard, it's going to be a lot of modulation. If I push it light, it's going to be a little amount of modulation. So really cool things you can do with velocity. Now you also have velocity off options. And to do this, we'll turn the release up. You'll notice it's not gonna do anything when I hit a key, but when the velocity goes off, that's when it enables the modulation. We also have gate options, which is another cool thing to do with release up. You can really hear it. If I hit a note, it's going to basically be the max amount of modulation based off velocity. And then when I let go, it's going to reset it back to zero. You can really hear it there. And then inverse gate, which is the opposite of that. Now you can also get in here and draw your own segments using the paint tools here. So you can go and add different points. So if you want this to be like this. And let's also map this to pitch so you can really hear what's going on. Now it's changing pitch based off velocity, which is kind of crazy. 
Some dark vibes there. And with these tools here on the side, you can move one node like this. With this one selected, you can move them all together. You also have additional tools where you can draw in by steps. You can get really, really crazy with this. Let's turn off the pitch and just go back to note pitch. And you also have snap to grid, so it snaps to grid markers, and you can change vertical grid. This would be useful in an instance where you were on note velocity, and you'd maybe set this to 12. So let's initialize unidirectional. We've talked about this. You have bidirectional and unidirectional. Same thing. We're set to 12, and let's use the brush tool and just draw in a couple different notes because we have this set to 12 and each step would technically be a semitone. So now what's happening is I'm only hitting C on the keyboard, but it's changing pitch based off how hard I'm hitting the note. So you can really do some unique things with the key trackers. So let's take this off, and now let's talk about performers. Performers are a way of having sequenced modulation. And what that means is you can make modulation do different things. Instead of just having one LFO shape, you can actually draw in your own shapes and have multiple sequences of different performers. To do that, here we have P1, P2, so these are three different performers. And within each performer, you have different scenes, if you will, or different sequences that you can have. Now, you have the same type of drawing tools here. So we can go and click different nodes, use the paintbrush and draw different things. This is your grid setting. So it doesn't actually change time, but what it does is it changes how you draw on the grid. So if we change it to this one, you'll see the grid markers get smaller and you can go and draw even smaller nodes. This here is your loop. You can stretch it up to eight counts. We're just going to keep it short for now. And let's just map this to the filter. See what happens. Let's make it a little more drastic. Now, this is based off of my rate, which is right here. And you can control this. And you also have the ability to control the time signature that it's playing within. Let's make this release real short for right now. So if we go back, Let's slow this down. You can also do this as bi-directional. And if we pull this filter, now you'll see you have the same options that we showed you earlier. So now it flips back and forth between that filter, which is pretty cool. We can initialize it. It sets it all flat. Here we have our vertical grid. This would be great for creating an arpeggiator. So let's take it off of the filter. Let's put this on pitch. Change this to 12, so each step is a different note. And we can draw in different notes here. Let's just make this two bar cycle. So 
So really cool what you can do there. Now beyond this, let's make this a little longer. If we go to overlay and turn this on, you can actually determine what you're drawing within each section. And what I mean by that is let's expand these by using these two controls. Initialize it. And now when we go to draw, you'll see it takes up this whole space. And you can get some cool time signatures and different things by doing it like this. <laughs> So you can actually control how long different points of modulation are being held by using this overlay feature, which is really, really unique. Let's turn this off, put this back on our filter. And let's also put it on the wave here, see what that sounds like once we draw something in. So as I said, you can have different sequences. So now we can go to sequence two and maybe do a finer grid. And really get some unique things by having different sequences play. Now, one other thing, if you click in the middle, of a line, you can actually determine whether it's linear or parabolic. You can change the curve just by clicking and dragging. It gives you some cool options. So now you're probably asking, I have all these different sequences. What do I do with them? How do I trigger them? How do I use them? So to do that, we're going to go to the remote option here, and you'll notice here they are my two sequences. You have a couple different things you can do. Right now it's set to loop. You can also set it to one shot. And I like to change this from remote to key. And what that does is anytime you push a key, it's gonna re-trigger the scene. If it's on remote, it's just gonna play wherever it is free running within that sequence. So I like to put it on key. And then if it's on one shot, it's going to run through the sequence one time and then stop. Now, when it comes to actually triggering these scenes, you can turn remote on and choose what key range you want to trigger them. So for instance, let's move these down to C2, C3. Now, if I hit C3, you'll see how it's on the first sequence. If I hit C sharp, it's going to go to my second sequence. If it's on key, then anytime you re-trigger, it's going to change to the other sequence. If I put it back on remote, you can switch between them while holding a note. So really cool options. You can have a ton of different performers set up. You can have them map to pitch. You can have them map to wavetables, all sorts of different things, and trigger them with remote octave using your key bed and the select range that you want it set on. That is one of the craziest, coolest features within Massive X is being able to have this control to make cool arpeggiators or make different synths wobble in unique ways and you can really dial them in. The last modulator type here is the voice randomization. And this, in my opinion, I like to use it to give it more of an analog synth vibe. You know, with analog synths, they're never perfectly in tune. And that's kind of what makes them unique and gives them their character. What I like to do with voice randomization is take this and put it on my pitch and maybe just go up like 20 cents. And let me play before so you have an idea. And 
Now let's turn this up 20 cents. Basically, what it's doing is it's applying a fixed modulation value per voice, and this can be applied to different parameters. Again, I like to use it to get that analog synth vibe, and it can be pretty much mapped to anything. So as far as the modulation goes, I'm just going to go over it one more time. You can click these little cross arrows and add modulation sources to anything. So you can take envelopes or performers, put them on pitch, on gain, on different effect levels. You, you really have so many options with being able to modulate any parameter with any of the modulators, whether it's a performer, an exciter, or an LFO. And to do that, it's literally as simple as clicking and dragging. And what I really love is once you've done this, and once you start doing it, you, you kind of start to see what is happening within Massive. You see all these different colors, and now you know exactly where they're mapped and what they're mapped to and what they're doing. So by simply looking here, I see P2. It's orange. I'm going to go to P2 and see what's going on in this performer and why it's affecting that LFO. And that's one of my favorite things. I've had a lot of favorite things, but that's one of my favorite things about Massive X is once you understand that, when you see all the different colors and all the movement that's happening, you really get a grasp on exactly what's going on. The routing page. The one page you see and you're like, what is happening here? And we're going to break this down. It's actually so much easier to understand than you think. So let's, let's do this. Basically, your sound generators are black. And that's your oscillators, your noise, and your mods here. The things that are gray... These are all processors, so filters, insert effects, stereo effects, things like that. Now this is your feedback loop, it's your output, here's your input. Let's start simple. Here's oscillator one. We can click and it starts to create a line. Now we can put this wherever we want in the chain. This is like taking your synth and deciding where you want to send it to. Do you want to send it to your speakers, or do you want to send it to a reverb and then send it to your speakers? That's basically the idea here. So to start, let's take oscillator one and send it straight to the output, which is right here. Now, oscillator one is going directly to the output. It's not going through any filters, any noise. If I turn this noise up, nothing is going to happen because it's not going through the chain. Now, because noise is a generator, I can also take the noise, send it straight to the output. Now you're going to hear the noise. And we can do that with noise one and noise two. So now we understand that. Let's double click to delete the lines. And let's bring the filter into the mix here. Here's our filter. Let's go ahead and assign a filter to it. What's really cool is if you turn the filter off, you'll notice it grays it out here in the routing, and that's visually really pleasing. So now we're going to take oscillator one. We're going to run it out to the input of the filter. And now the filter, we're going to run out, and let's go straight to the output. And now... <laughs> You can use this filter to control oscillator one. We can take oscillator two, bypass the filter, and go straight to the output. Let's turn up oscillator two. Now you'll notice if I turn down the filter, you're still hearing that sine wave. Let's make it something a little more drastic. I turn up the filter, you start to hear oscillator one come into the mix because only oscillator one is going through the filter. Let's clear these lines. Now let's add a insert effect, A, which is right here. Let's put distortion. Let's go out of the filter, into the distortion, out of the distortion, to the output. Let's also send oscillator two 
through the same signal chain. No distortion. Distortion. So that's the basic idea of routing. You have B and C. These are your other insert effects. So if you want to, you can route to these separate from the filter to each effect and then from the effect to the output. Or you can run them all together and go from A to B, from B to C, and C to the output. And now if we add additional effects, here's a bit crusher, and let's do a frequency shifter. So now we're processing from the oscillators through the filter, then to the effects. And you don't have to do it this way. You can, you can totally do this the other way and put your filter down here at the end, go from the oscillator to the effects, then from the effects to the filter, then to the output. And now the filter is last in the chain. So now we can filter everything, including all the effects, with this one knob. So that's a little idea on routing. Now it can get more complex. We haven't even added the stereo effects in. So we can remove this and let's add stereo delay and go from the filter to the delay. And turn that off just so it's a little more pleasing. So now you're getting the delay from the filter. And if I filter down, And you can also change the routing of the stereo effects by simply clicking these, and it shows you the direction that it's going to change them in. One other thing we can do is feedback. So we can send the output of the filter to our feedback, and then take the input and send it to the output of the feedback. And now you're getting that feedback loop. So when we turn up the feedback, you're going to start to hear interesting things. Because now we're feeding back into itself, creating a loop. So that's just one way. Now, if we were talking about the phase modulation that I mentioned earlier, let's reset this. What we would do is take oscillator 2, send it to phase modulation, oscillator 1 goes to the output. So now oscillator 1 is going to the output. We'll turn on auxiliary, turn this up, and turn up the auxiliary phase modulator. And that's how you map oscillator 2 to the phase modulator so it can control oscillator 1. It's that easy. Let's give you one more example here. We talked about the exciter and how you can use it as an oscillator. Well, what we can do, exciter is modulator three. Let's go back to routing. Let's take the exciter and put it on mod one. You can move these wherever you want. Now that it's here, let's run this into a couple effects. And then maybe to the reverb. And right now you're just hearing a click. Right? And we can control how this click sounds by changing the ratio. That's a little lower. It's almost like a kick drum. And since we're routing into A and B, let's put a ring modulator on A. And on B, Let's put some distortion. Now let's go back and adjust. And 
Let's put some reverb. Let's go back to our routing page so you can see what's going on. So from now we're going, we've basically just created a whole new oscillator by taking the exciter, putting it on a mod, going from the mod to some effects, ring modulation, distortion, and then to a reverb. Let's turn the size up and the mix. Right, now if I turn oscillator one straight to the output and two straight to the output, let's turn those up. You can hear when I hold down a note, it'll keep playing oscillators one and two, but our exciter will cut off because it's just that short blip. Just a really cool way to almost create another oscillator by using mods with routing. So that's a general idea on the routing section. Again, it's a lot easier once you start simple and just draw an oscillator to the output and see what it sounds like. And then take it to the filter and see what it sounds like. Now let's go to the voice tab. Here in the voicing tab, you're gonna have your global transpose so you can shift everything up or down semitones. You have pitch bend control. Right now it's plus two, negative two. So let's make it drastic. So you have a lot of control, double click to reset it. Under that we have glide. Let's turn glide on up here by clicking this and changing the millisecond time. I'm gonna show you what that does by switching it to mono for a second. Set it really long. So that's what glide is. It basically glides from one note to the other. Let's go back to polyphonic because it's interesting with polyphonic. First off, in polyphonic mode, you can have up to 64 voices. Now remember that the more voices, it's gonna put a pretty heavy load on your CPU, but 64 voices is a crazy amount. Right now it's set to eight, that's pretty common. And let's see what happens. When glide is on in polyphonic mode and legato is turned on. And let's turn off legato. Here how it, when it's off, it glides the first note. You can also change the type of glide fade from whether it's exponential, linear. Let's turn this back on and go to mono mode. Now in mono mode, here's glide. Mono is one voice, so it's only ever going to play one voice no matter how many notes you hold. And you have a couple different options here. With note off, it's not going to do the glide until I let go of the note. See when I let go of the second note, then it glides. You have note on will glide first, and then when I let go, it won't glide. Here it snaps off. And then you have note on and off. And it does it both ways. You have this other option here called legato, and what that does, let's just put a LFO on our wavetable here. With legato on, it's gonna reset the LFO when I glide to the next note. With it off, the LFO is gonna keep going and the note's just gonna jump in. See how it's not consistent? Whereas when it's on, it's the same every time. Let's disable that. The engine setup, now right now it's on free run. This is the most common to an analog synthesizer. Those oscillators are doing their thing in the background regardless of what's happening. They are moving and building up resonance. That's what's going on. When reset all is on, you have an option to actually set the spread and the phase of these oscillators. So that way every time you hit a note, 
everything resets, your comb filters, things like that, they all start at the same time every single time. If you want consistency, you want to change it to reset all. You also have reset OSC, and this basically means it's going to reset the oscillators and the oscillators only every time you hit a note. You can also adjust the starting phase of noise right here. And now let's talk about unison. So clicking here turns unison on, and when it's set to one voice, you're not going to hear anything. Let's turn this up to three. And I'm only playing one note right now. And the idea behind this is with analog synths, when they were limited to the amount of voices they could play, you would use unison and it basically stacks different frequencies within that note to make it sound like you're playing multiple notes. It's actually really cool. So you can go up to six voices. And it's really just harmonics on a single note, but it sounds like you're playing multiple notes. So if I play a chord, compared to with it off, it sounds a lot bigger. You also have stereo width, so you can change the spread of these voices. Here on your scale, you can change the detuning. So if I turn this up, you're gonna really hear the tune effect. Down. So this is usually pretty good, around 30%. You also have the option to change this to wide, and now it's in semitones. So you can really dial in exactly how many semitones you want. Let's go up to an octave. So you can do a lot of, lot of stuff here. Now when this is set to scale, let's m merge this over to the harmonization side. If it's in the middle, it's going to be a mix of unison voices and harmonies. Doesn't sound the best there. You could probably make it sound really good. But let's push all the way over to the harmonization, and now we're in a scale mode. And you have all these different scales to choose from. pentatonic scales. And different chord sets. And you can also change between the scale note here. And you have chord detune here. So that's unison mode. Again, it's, it's really cool for beefing up your sound and making it sound huge and massive even if you're only playing one note. Now let's talk about the last thing here, which are the macro controls. Macro controls with different presets are typically pre-mapped and ready to go. They give you 16 different controls and they make it really easy for you to be able to just turn a knob or map it within your DAW and it's already pre-mapped to multiple parameters. So the cool thing about this is if you just need to change the attack really fast or turn up the reverb or change the glide, most of the time these parameters are already mapped on the macros. And if they're not, they're really easy to map. So let's check that out, let's do it. Let's just go to a preset here and you'll see up top all of these red numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Again, you have 16 are already mapped and named. So you can see this is position one. This is your cutoff here. And if I turn this, it changes the cutoff of my filter. And that's, again, just a really easy way to change a parameter without having to look for it. So whenever you get into Massive X, if you're trying to find something, the first thing I always look at are my macro controls because 90% of the time, it's right there up top. If you want to add a macro to anything, all you do is click the number and drag it to whatever you want. So let's say this is reverb. We can click nine. And let's drag it to the mix. And there it is. We can say how much we want it to, to manipulate. Let's turn this down like that. And now if I turn this up or down. No reverb, full reverb. 
And it's it's literally that easy. And if you double click, you can actually name these. We could say reverb. Now we have our reverb. Really great if you want to save patches, you can go and name all of your macros. It's that easy. I love the macro controls. And on this same bar, you also have your pitch bend, your modulation, and your aftertouch. Modul these work the same way as the macros. You can just take this and drag it to wherever you want. So if we want to control our wave oscillation, maybe we want to control the filter, and we want to control the reverb amount all with one modulation knob. I'm controlling multiple parameters with one modulation knob just by dragging that to different parameters. It's really that easy. You also have aftertouch. With aftertouch, this works the same way. You can drag this to any of these features if your MIDI controller supports aftertouch. And that's where when you've pushed down on a key and you push a little further, it'll actually activate the aftertouch and then it will trigger that parameter that you have it mapped to. So that's the macro controls. With pitch bend, you can also do the same thing and map it to anything that you want just by simply clicking and dragging it wherever you want to go. Now that we know the whole plugin, I'm going to load up a project that I made in Machine. It's got some dope drums, and I want to use Massive X to create a synth lead, a bass, and a pad. Let's do it. Pretty straightforward track. So let's load up this synth. This is it. And right off the bat, I think it could be a cool synth, but I'm just not liking the LFO. And looking at this, I see LFO 4 is being mapped to the pitch. So there's two things I can do. I could right click and just delete them. Or under LFO, I can just turn it down. And it's gone. If I turn it up, you really hear it. Other thing I want to do is go to the delay, which looks like it's going to a macro. And I just want to turn up the feedback. And the reverb, let's just turn up the reverb macro. And also the cutoff, let's turn the cutoff up which is actually going to turn it down based off the modulation that's set here. Perfect. Let's record. Next thing here is the bass. It's a preset called Modern 8. Let's check it out. First thing I want to do is turn this release up. Let's turn up the distortion, which is actually mapped to macro 5. And let's go over to the voice tab, switch this to mono. Let's turn up the glide. And this is really what it's about, is getting the presets to fit inside your track. Let's record this bass. The bass is sounding great. Now let's add this synth pad in here. I really like this one, but I want to change the attack. Now I'm hearing this like fizz. I'm assuming it's this. Let's turn it down. Named properly. Let's turn this attack up as well. And let's turn off the delay. That's great. So 
it's just knowing where things are and seeing them and knowing what to adjust. Let's let's record this in there. Do some quick arranging. Now let's play it back. And that is how to use everything in Massive X. Now, if we miss something, let us know in the comments below. I definitely recommend checking out a similar series with our product specialist, Boris, who covers how to use everything in machine. Grab Massive X over at nativeinstruments.com. Thanks for watching. See you next time.